All right. Welcome to Money Club Mondays. It's on uh, uh, November. Oh, here we go. November 22nd, 2021. So welcome. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, crazy uh, Thanksgiving week. Is everybody ready for Thanksgiving? Got those turkeys purchased and all the fixings that go along with them. I'm looking forward to it myself. So we'll be, uh, we'll be wide open the rest of today, tomorrow, Wednesday. We'll have a full schedule of webinars. What the F, uh, first thing in the morning, 9.30 Eastern, the Wealth Webinar Series, part two of six for the new Money Multiplier se uh, weekly series that we're doing. And then uh, Ask Me Anything will finish off the week. And then the team will be taking a break Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. And we'll be back next Monday uh, with Money Club Mondays and a full week ready to rock and roll. So if anybody needs anything, uh, just please let me know, snaky at chrisnoggle.com or send me a text, 561-313-6213. Uh, today, we're going to go through, um, I just wanted to go through funding deals, you know, what that looks like, and especially revolving around using your money multiplier policies to do so. So we'll talk a little bit about infinite banking and what that looks like and why that might be a good idea to do private lending uh, or purchase real estate. Um, through your money multiplier, uh, whole life policy. So that's what we're going to go through today. Uh, and then we have a, a few new deals that I just wanted to mention in case anybody's looking for any deals. Uh, those, those are looking to be funded here very soon. Um, so wanted to go through that. And then if anybody has any questions or if anything's popped up recently, please put those in the Q&A box because I do want to make sure I hit those. I don't have a whole lot today. So hopefully you guys have some questions or some different topics that I can get into with you and we can kind of go through that. So if you have any topics or anything like that, let me know and we'll definitely get through that. So let's see here. Um, everybody can hear me, right? All right, all right. So just uh, let me look through the comments. All right, yeah, hey, Shauna Farzane, Greg, aloha from the big island, love it. Chris morning around the 60s at sunrise. That's cool for, for Hawaii. I'm in... South Florida, it's been warm here. We've had a lot of rain the last over the weekend. Lots and lots of rain since Friday, but it's uh, clearing out. It looks like we might get a little more this afternoon and clearing out and should be a really nice uh, rest of the week for Thanksgiving and going into the weekend. Looks like we have a cool front coming. So some low 70s and getting in the 50s at night. So that should be enjoyable. Uh, let's see, Michael's up in, in Buffalo. Uh, cooking for the first time. All right, Michael, sounds good. All right. And sorry, we were, um, we missed last week. If anybody was trying to hop on for Money Club Mondays, we sent a couple emails out. Hopefully you guys are getting those alerts when we don't have Money Club Mondays. But if you tried to hop on, my apologies. I was out of the country flying back from the, the Bahamas with my wife on Monday. So was not able to get on and do anything. But um, but thanks for being here today. So let's go ahead and dive in. So like I mentioned, there are a couple of deals. Chris Noggle had two deals come up. I think both of those are being closed out right now and funded um, but he does have two new Chris Rude deals that are coming up this week that need funding. And then we have a couple new uh, an investor. Let me just tell you their name so you guys can look out for them. Uh, let me see. So Chris Rude works with a couple investors. Their names are Brandon and Dwight. I don't personally know them yet, but I'm sure I'll be getting familiar with them. Uh, Chris said they are very, very experienced borrowers and investors. They've done well over 1,000 deals. So they're a very good borrower to work at worth, and they're going to be coming to the private money club here very soon. They'll be being onboarded in the next week or two, and they're going to start posting all their deals on privatemoneyclub.com. So I was talking with a couple of people last week, privatemoneyclub.com. As you can see, when we did the demo two weeks ago, we just had a little, um, some little bugs that we had to work out and we're making some improvements to the way the deals are posted and just making it very, very easy for someone that's looking for a deal where they can go on and just see everything in one place, you know, put in their parameters. If they have a hundred thousand or 200,000, they could search and find the deals very, very quickly. So we're working on improving privatemoneyclub.com. And then we have meetings lined up over the next month with three or four different companies that build and develop apps. So we're going to build the Private Money Club app. And the Private Money Club app is going to be plain and simple. It's going to be just like those online dating sites where you can literally go on and you can just look at deals real quickly. Hey, do you like this deal? You know, push it to the right, 
to save it in your favorites, to go back and get more information. And it will alert the borrower and let them know that you are interested in that deal and that you would like to um, you know, maybe fund that deal. And then if you're not interested in something, if it doesn't make sense, just swipe it the other way and it'll go out of your feed. So you won't have to see it anymore. So that's all the app's going to be is just yes or no on interest and deals. It'll show you the details, but everything else that we have on privatemoneyclub.com, all the training and the videos and the education and the turnkey properties and the notes and the private funds and all of that is going to stay on privatemoneyclub.com specifically. The app is just going to be plain and simple. Pull up your phone if you're looking for a deal or want ideas and be able to swipe through it. So we're going to get that project going the first of the year. We're interviewing companies right now to do that. And uh, so exciting stuff coming up. So right now, though, anybody that has money, they're looking to lend. If you don't see anything on privatemoneyclub.com, please let me know. Because there are deals available right now. They just haven't been onboarded on privatemoneyclub.com. So if anybody really wants that, um, if anybody really wants, you know, has money that they're looking to move right now, just let me know and I'll help you guys get that placed. I just talked with a guy on Thursday and, um, and we're getting his money placed right now through a couple of uh, Noggle and Rude deals. So if you have anything, let us know. All right, so where is this money coming from, right? So let's just say, hey, you know, Chris Rude has a deal at 12% annual interest. Or, you know, these new guys that are coming on board, they're going to bring out a bunch of deals and they're going to all be in the 10 to 12% range. So if you're looking to grow your money at that 12, 10 to 12% range, you know, where is that money coming from? And that's what I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about today. And I'm going to show a couple of examples as we get going. All right. So just as a quick review, if you've been on here before, or if you, um, you know, have been coming on the money clubs, you know, just as a good reminder of, you know, where are possible sources of funding, okay? So sources of funds. A lot of times we call this lazy money, right? All right, so where could some lazy money possibly be right now? Where is some money that could be sitting around that you could be putting to work instead of it just losing money, right? Put it in the comments real fast. Where is lazy money? Yeah, Jade, I'll hit, I'll hit that in a minute, Jade. If I forget, just put it in the Q&A so I don't forget in case the chat starts moving. Okay, equity, absolutely. So let's specifically talk about, okay, a whole HELOC, which is home equity line of credit. Meaning if you have a home that's appreciated in value over the last year, 18 months, odds are you have equity in your home right now, right? And what that means is let's say you own $100,000, you owe $100,000 on your mortgage and your home is now worth $300,000, okay? That means you have $200,000 in equity, okay? So what you can do is you can call up a bank and you can have a bank, tell a bank, say, hey, um, you know, I'm interested in a home equity line of credit. You know, what are you guys doing right now for HELOCs? And they're going to tell you, hey, we're offering HELOCs right now in your area. And I would check multiple banks. I would call a couple local community banks. I would check with the bank you bank with now. And I would check with a couple larger banks and ask them, you know, what are their rates? What is their, what are their terms? So how much interest are they going to charge, right? So what is that line of credit? What is the interest on that? What are the terms for repayment? So if you, you know, let's say you have $200,000 in equity or in, in a HELOC and you borrow $100,000, what's the repayment look like? Are you paying interest only? Are you paying principal and interest? Uh, you want to ask them, is that fixed? The interest is a fixed or variable. Do they have an introductory offer going on right now? You know, there's a lot of different factors and then any fees. So is the bank, are they going to want to charge you any fees to open the HELOC? Are they going to charge you any ongoing fees? They shouldn't. Most HELOCs, they shouldn't involve fees, but ask those questions because you need to know up front. Are they going to make you pay for an appraisal? Are there any closing costs involved to open the HELOC? Things like that. There shouldn't be, again, with the HELOC. Now, if you're doing it like a cash out refi or something like that, that's different, but just for a HELOC. And then, you know, what are they willing? So if you have, if you have 200,000 in equity, how much are they willing to offer? Will they, will they do 70%? Well, they do 80%. You know, most people, most banks are not going to offer 100% of the available equity. So if you have 80% of 200,000 available, 
you have, what is that? $160,000. So now you know you have 160,000 at, let's say 3.5%, no fees and interest only repayment, okay? There's probably gonna be some principal in there, but just as an example, right? So those are, you know, that's what you would look for. And those are your answers. And then you would write this down and you say, okay, ABC Community Bank, this is what they have. Uh, Wells Fargo National Bank, this is what they have. Chase, this is what they offer, right? So you can go through and you can compare and then pick what works best for your situation. I was talking to Claire. I don't know if Claire's on here right now. I don't see Claire, but I was talking to Claire last week and she had like three different banks or maybe two, I think she had two different banks. She was working with two different banks and they had completely different terms. One was willing to offer more uh, percentage on the equity but a higher interest rate. One was off offering less equity, but a little bit lower interest rate. And then one of them was like a special interest rate that, that um, increased in like 12 months or something like that. So just make sure you're finding out all that information. And then if you need any help with that, send it over. I'm happy to walk it through. Those of you in the private money club, I'm happy to walk you through, you know, what the pros and cons and, and what to look for. So Ethan said he's getting a 90% HELOC set up now with a local credit union. So I love that. So local, local community banks, local credit unions can be a, an excellent option for those. All right. Okay, so what else? A HELOC. Somebody said a 401k. Okay. So a 401k could be some lazy money. A lot of people right now think that the stock market is at all-time highs and it's going to correct or come down. So if all of your money is in a 401, if, if all of your retirement funds are sitting in a 401k and you can't, you know, you're under 59 and a half years old, you're still at that company. So you can't like transfer that money to like a self-directed IRA or something of that nature because it's stuck in that 401k right now. Well, what does your 401k offer? A lot of 401ks don't offer conservative investment funds to put your money in. So maybe you have to be in all equities. And if you think that the equity markets, the stock markets at all time highs right now, it's going to come down, but you want to, so you want to get your money out of equities, but put it somewhere. Well, maybe they only offer a cash account. So that would get it out of equities. But if it's sitting in a cash account, what's the problem with that? There's no interest being paid anywhere right now. Right. And where's inflation? Uh, well, they say it's at 6.4. I think when you factor in a lot of stuff, it's double digit inflation right now. So your money just sitting in a cash accounts, losing six to 12% interest right now on an annual basis. So that's no good. So we don't want it just sitting. So what are our other options? We can't touch the money without getting penalized or paying taxes. So one of the options could be a 401k loan. Okay. So right now you can borrow 50k or or 50% of what's in there, whatever's higher, all right? So if you had 90,000 in there, they might only let you borrow 45. If you have a million dollars in there, they'll let you borrow up to 50,000. And some 401ks do some different things too. So call your 401k um, administrator, so it might be your HR department or whoever at work, and ask them, what are my options for a 401k loan? Am I able to transfer any of my 401k money to a self-directed IRA. Some 401ks, active 401ks will allow you to do a portion of it or some of it, but ask what your options are. Once you know your options are, you then can decide what's right for your situation. And one of those could be a 401k loan. So yes, yeah, so you can move all, all of it out of the, the 401k and protect it, um, but at least you can get $50,000 of it out, right? So then it's not just sitting in a, in a safe cash account. You can actually, you know, losing money through um, inflation. You can actually get that money out there to work for you. For example, in one of these passive investment loans where you're building your money at 10, 12%, you're outpacing inflation creating. Because what happens with a 401k loan? The interest, the interest that you pay goes back to your 401k. So you're going to pay, let's say 6% interest on the loan, but that money all goes back into your 401k. So there's, you know, an argument there to be made that that can make sense. And uh, that's definitely one option. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, David, absolutely. So David said, so a 401k loan can be an option. So David just said a home equity agreement. All 
great. So a home equity agreement, if you've been following, if you've ever been to one of our three-day trainings, or you've seen maybe one of the past wealth webinars, we brought on a guy named Matthew Sullivan, who works with a company, Quantum RE, and they provide what are called home equity agreements. Home equity agreements allow you to tap into the lazy money that's in your home, just like a HELOC, except instead of it being a, a line of credit, they give you the equity in cash now to use however you want to use. So one of the benefits to that is there's no repayments. So there's no repayments. So if you, you know, so if you have a hundred thousand dollars, right, and you lend that hundred thousand dollars out at twelve percent, you're gonna create a thousand dollars a month income. Okay, so let's just say you have a, you're able to get a hundred thousand dollars equity in your home, either through a HELOC or a home equity agreement. You take that hundred thousand dollars and you lend it to Chris Rude on a, on a deal, and that pays 12% interest-only payments. So of that $100,000, when they're using your money, you're going to receive $1,000 a month check in the mail every single month that, that Chris Rude is using your money on that deal, okay? Now, if you have a, a HELOC, that $100,000 HELOC might have a repayment of, let's say, $600 a month. I don't know whatever it is, right? So $600 a month is now going to the HELOC and you're making a thousand, your cash flow is 400 a month cash flow, right? So $400 a month cash flow for doing nothing is excellent. You're replenishing your line of credit to be able to use the next time, that's fine. But let's say you wanna create cash flow that you can use more of that cash flow right now, right? Because 400 is good, but a thousand is better. So with a home equity agreement, what this does is this gives you that same $100,000 and you can do the same loan, create the same money, but there's no repayment. The home equity agreement gets repaid later, years down the line when you resell your home. Then when you sell your home, that's when the equity that was given to you today gets repaid back to Quantum RE, for example. Does that make sense to you guys? So that way, instead of having to make that $600 a month payment here and cash flowing $400, we're keeping $1,000 a month cash flow every single month. So now it's allowing us just more cash flow to be used. So if you're, for example, retired and you're looking to use this money for retirement income, that could be a great way to do it. So just a couple examples, you know, and you got to explore what's better, a HELOC, a home equity line of agreement for your situation, and home equity agreements aren't offered everywhere. So they don't operate in all 50 states. They don't operate in all suburban locations and rural locations and things like that. So you got to make sure that you're able to be approved and qualified. So, yeah, so I appreciate that. Were there any other sources of funding or lazy money that anybody has thought about that you think might be useful? Okay, I don't see anything coming in, so we're going to move right along. So, of course, if you have money in an old 401k or an IRA, you can move that over to a self-direct to control the money that way. Um, you know, there's lots of different sources for funding. You know, we don't talk a lot about like budgets and things like that, but one of the things when you get started, you know, kind of look at where is your money going, right? Like, and, and kind of take a look at that and see if you can clear some up, see if you can free it up. And any dollar that you can free up, we can then take that money and put that money to work and create more dollars for you. So it's a good exercise once a year to kind of go through where's all your money going? What investments are they going to? You know, you should reset, you know, if you're putting a money right, if you're still dumping a lot of money into like a brokerage account, if you're not actively trading it and keeping an eye on it, if you're just kind of like putting the money in there and letting it do its thing and like non-qualified accounts, you know, maybe it's a good time to uh, to take a look at that. So, yeah, Treasury bonds, uh, Moki can be can be a good place to um, to invest some money right now too. You know, pretty safe place. Um, excess business capital. Check with your CPA, Jay. That's an excellent suggestion. You know, if your business is creating a lot of money, it's just sitting around in business accounts. Can we get that money moving? Because again, that money just sitting there is not doing anything for you. So yeah, speak with your CPA and see if there's any extra money around. You know, I'm a big fan of three months of expenses 
in an emergency a fund that's that's accessible very quickly. But you know, over time, maybe that's built up to where you now have six months or nine months or 12 months sitting there. If so, you know, are you comfortable with just three months? Can we take the rest of that money that you had saved and put that money to work now? Okay. Um, and keep in mind, whenever we do these different types of loans, you know, three to six months, you have six to 12 months, you have 12 to 36 months, and then you have, you know, three plus years. So this would kind of be like short term, kind of like mid short term, mid level short term. So it's like short, short term, mid level, short term, me medium term, long term. And these are the different types of investments. When you're looking in the private money club, you know, these are the different ones that are available for you, you know? So a Chris Rood flip is probably going to be three to six months and you're going to get your, your capital return. So a hundred thousand dollars goes in, you're paid, um, you know, interest only for three to six months. The deal is done. You get your principal investment back. Six to 12 months might be more like a, a Luke Medico deal. So Luke Medico in the private money club is doing a lot of deals right now, but because of the way that he's financing them and doing them with the Burr method, it's taken, it's probably going to be like more six to nine to 12 months before that thing's refined and you're paid back on it. Um, so, so if you're looking to control your money, you know, those make a lot of sense because you put it out, you earn the interest and you get your money back and you're able to use that money for the next dealer, for the next opportunity that, that arises. And if you're waiting to maybe start purchasing real estate, when prices start to come down, maybe it makes sense to do some of the shorter or middle term stuff. Right. Um, but if your money's in a self-directed IRA or you're the kind of person that's just like, you know what? I have a few million dollars. I just need to make sure it's working. I'm busy doing my other stuff right now. I don't really care you know, to manage this money every three to six to 12 months. I just want to put it somewhere safe, get that money interest or that interest coming in on a regular basis, make sure it's protected. It's, it's positioned right where the risk is very, very minimal. And I just want it working for me for three to five years. And I don't want to think about it for the next three to five years. You know, this would be the great option for that. So um, so look at what your situation is, what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are, and that'll help you start narrowing down what types of investments are good. And then once you narrow down those investments, then we can start looking for, you know, what returns do you want? Eight, 10, 12, 15%. You know, do you want to make sure your first lien position, second lien, what makes sense for you? You know, what kind of deal, where is it located? Who's the investor? What's the risk level? All that good stuff that we always talk about, right? Um, but narrowing it down, your investment options is a great first step. All right. And then one of the ones that I really wanted to hit on today and give you guys a couple examples on would be using All right. So what do I mean by TMM? IBC WL. Who can put it in first? While you're doing that, I'm going to pull up. Okay, and, and real fast, while you guys are answering that, what does this mean, guys? TMM, these are, these are three abbreviations all of you should know. TMM, IBC, WL. What, what, what am I talking about when I'm talking about that right there? There you go, Moki, there's one. TMM, the money multiplier. And then while you're answering that, Jade, it is always better to use your LLC to lend or are there instances where you can use your own name? Yeah, good question. You can definitely use your own name to lend. Um, what you really want to avoid is lending money to an individual, okay? So you, I can lend from Stephen Nagy, from myself, from my personal account or just my personal name on the contract. I just never want to lend to Chris Noggle. I want to lend to Noggle Homes LLC, always. So, or I can lend from, you know, Stephen Nagy LLC to Noggle Homes LLC. But even from there, I never want to lend from Stephen Nagy LLC to Chris Noggle individual, right? So that's what you want to really be careful with, Jade. But as far as lending from your personal name versus an LLC, um, talk with your accountant about that. There's no right or wrong answer on that. It's typically if you're just doing a few lending deals here and there, you know, you might not really need an LLC to do that. If you already have one set up for this kind of thing, you know, it makes sense to run it through it, I guess. Um, but it doesn't really matter one way or another. Yes, thank you guys. You got it. So IBC, 
So TMM, money multiplier, IBC, infinite banking concept, WL, whole life, which are the specially designed and engineered whole life policies that we create at the money multiplier to be used for infinite banking concept. This is simply the plain and boring vehicle that's used to be able to create the power of everything else that we do um, here at the money multiplier, okay? And that's what I wanna show you is how to start using your infinite banking policies to do these private lending deals that we were just talking about to make sure that you're taking full advantage of this specially designed and engineered whole life insurance policy, okay? Because let me ask you guys this question real fast. What are the main reasons why people get into this? Why did you first get into this? If you have a policy already, why did you first, like what caught your eye? What were you first trying to accomplish? Or if you're thinking about opening a policy, why? Like, what are you trying to do with it? Okay. All right, Sean said, recapture all my payments from cars, right? And we can do that with anything, right? So Brent Kessler um, used one of his policies to buy a new airplane last year, all right? So the difference in, in, a, in doing that, to buy, in using a policy to buy a car, you know, whether it's a, a, a Hyundai, uh, what kind of, what's a cheap car, a Honda Accord, or whether it's a new Corvette, or whether it's a twin engine, you know, Piper Cessna, whatever, right? The only difference is how many zeros are on that purchase. The recycle and the recapture of the interest and the money going back to your bank, instead of going giving all that to a finance company or some other bank, it's all the same. It's just how many zeros are on that initial amount and how many how much money is being repaid to you um, in, in the recapture process, right? So that's a great reason. Uh, pay off bills and recapture, okay? So debt, right? So, you know, credit card debt right now can be 17 to 29%. So if you're giving 17 to 29% of all of your money to a finance or bank, does it make sense to pay this loan off ourselves and then recapture? Recapture that 17, 29% back to ourselves. So if we're repaying $10,000 in credit card debt, for instance, but over time, we're not doing anything different. If we were paying the company 500 bucks before, we're going to repay ourselves the exact same $500. So whatever you were paying the credit card company before, we're going to pay that exact same money on a monthly basis still. So we're not eliminating that payment. But what we're doing is instead of giving... 17 to 29% of that $500 every month to the to the credit card company. We're now giving ourselves 17 to 29% back to our banks. So do you see how paying yourself 17 to 29% could allow you instead of giving to somebody else could allow you to start paying that down a lot quicker, right? So that's the really the basics behind the theory behind uh, using this to pay down debts is it allows you to recycle, recapture that money and do it so much faster because instead of giving all that lost interest to somebody else, it's now staying within our financial system and we're snowballing it and using it to pay off that debt even faster and faster. Okay. So plain and simple how that works. All right. So what else did you guys get started to do this with? Um, so recapture, build wealth, build wealth. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, build wealth. Let's see. Retirement, legacy. Okay, so legacy is a big one, right? Because, you know, the way we can look at it is one of the beautiful things about these policies that we don't ever talk about, you know, when it comes to these whole life policies, is we talk about all the power of them with the uninterrupted guaranteed compounding interest for the rest of your life. You know, we talk about how we can use these with our mapping team. We create the maps to, you know, recapture that money for buying cars, for paying off the debt and recapturing, you know, all the power of this. But one of the things we don't really talk about, but is huge, is the DB, the death benefit, right? So as Chris says, one day, all of us, you know, there's one of the three things that are guaranteed in life, taxes, 
uh, whatever in death, right? So and, and taxes is a hot one. Obviously, we talk about a lot, but um, so so you know, death. You know, it's going to happen to all of us. Chris likes to say it's when you graduate. Um, I don't really sugarcoat things as much, so I just say when you pass away or die. But uh, you know, so. So the death benefit though. So one of the cool things about these policies is, yeah, you have the power of creating your own bank and BYOB, become your own bank and privatize banking and everything that goes into the infinite banking concept. But someday you are going to have a death benefit that goes to whoever your beneficiaries, whoever you want your beneficiaries to be. And that death benefit all gets paid completely tax free. So it creates that legacy aspect of when you do pass someday, you're able to create something special for those of you in your life that you care about. And how many of you would love to leave the people that you truly care about in life with something more than just a memory of you or even debts? I mean, how many people pass away these days and the family scrambling to pay for final expenses and all that stuff, right? So it's starting to build that. I had this discussion. My dad was over at the house yesterday. We were just hanging out. He was playing with my son. Uh, we were watching some football and throwing football and hanging out. And I was, we were just, you know, kind of talking about all this stuff and investing and things like that. And I was just like, man, I was like, I don't think Bryce, my son's name is Bryce. I was like, I don't think Bryce realizes like the position he's going to be in later in life. When, when, when my wife and I, and we, and he starts getting these policies transferred to him because we're opening policies for him right now too. And he's just going to have, you know, so one of the things that we're really concentrating on, you know, he's six years old now. We're already starting to play uh, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad um, came out with a game. Robert Kiyosaki came out with a game a long time ago called, called the Cash Flow Game. And so starting to play these games with him to teach him financial education, because what comes with a lot of money, a lot of responsibility, right? So, you know, so many people you hear that go out there and blow money or they don't know what to do with it and they lose it all and things like that. There's great responsibility when you start talking, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So making sure to educate. And that's one of the things that I love about infinite banking also is not only, you know, and with this legacy is not only is it powerful for us right now, but it does allow you to show other people how to do it also, people in your family that you care about. Because if, I, if I'm gonna transfer a policy that's got you know, almost $100,000 in it to my son when he turns 20 years old, and then he's gotta start using it, you damn sure better be sure he's gonna know how to use it too, right? I'm not just gonna give it to him and all that cash value unless he understands what he's doing with it. So all this stuff really is very, very important. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, the legacy aspect is a huge part, especially when it comes along with building the wealth. So let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. All right. Okay. So once, so once your debts are paid off, once your can only, you know, you've bought all the vehicles you can buy at the time and all the airplanes and everything else you've wanted to purchase and you put the money in your bank. Maybe you're looking now for what can I do with the cash value that's sitting in my policy? Has anybody had that challenge yet where you're just like, all right, I got this cash value sitting here. I just don't know what to do with it, right? Has anybody experienced that yet? Well, one of the re reasons that the private money club was born was because of this issue right here. People were paying down their debt quicker than they thought possible. They were paying for vehicles they didn't need anymore. And they said, okay, well, what, what now? You know, and again, real estate investing is an excellent, excellent, excellent source, in my opinion, to create wealth, to build wealth. Go out there, you know, even, you know, flipping houses, whether you like that or not, 
long-term rentals, being involved in large apartment complexes, partnering with people to do Airbnb properties. These are all opportunities we brought onto the private money club over the last month, right? You guys saw Levi with the Airbnbs. He's looking to partner with people. Jack Petrick has been on talking about the large apartment complexes and new construction, everything he's doing. We have the private fund, uh, Safari, that's buying mobile home parks. So you can get involved in those if you want to. You can go out there and purchase your own rental properties and create the cash flow and the equity growth. Or if you're looking for something more passive, that's where the private money club really comes in uh, powerfully because it, it allows you to find these deals that you can lend your money on without having to go out there and actually develop these relationships. It's like kind of building these relationships for you. So I wanted to show a couple of examples of how we can do this, all right? So I'm gonna pull up a policy here. Let me just... Uh, Increase. Okay. All right. Let me pull this. Let me share my screen. This is a illustration we just did a, a few weeks ago for somebody. All right. So you guys can see this, right? Let me make sure. my chat box go all right there it is all right all right so this is a sample illustration um for somebody that we did a, a 41 year old um male and this is uh he wanted to put one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the first year and fifty thousand dollars annually after that so those of you that have policies or if you've just recently uh, applied for a policy. This is what you'll receive. That's called the illustration. And this is simply showing all of the numbers of what you can expect the policy to look like in upcoming years. Now, a couple things, if you've never seen one of these, I just want to point out real fast. Um, over here, it's the age of the person. So uh, when the policy would start to be 42 years old, um, first year of the policy, how much um, premium goes into the policy each year. And then we have guaranteed values. Now, again, Lafayette Life Insurance Company, One America, Mass Mutual, those are the three companies we primarily use for these infinite banking um, setups. And these three companies are financially very, very strong. They've been paying dividends consistently for over 120 some years. They've always paid above the guaranteed rate. And we have no reason to believe that they would ever pay below the guaranteed rate. And, and, and so when, whenever we look at these illustrations, we always use the non-guaranteed assumption side. And the reason for that is because we are very, very, very confident that those non-guaranteed interest dividends will continue to be paid out. We have no reason whatsoever to believe that 120 some years of consistent history should change anytime soon. OK, these companies are very good at what they do. And from the conversations we have with them, we fully believe that. And if anything, we believe that dividends will increase. And the reason for that is because right now we are at 35 year. It could be longer, actually, but just 35 years is how far we went back. And the dividends being paid right now that's being illustrated on this example, on this illustration, um, are at the lowest they've been in 35 years because where are interest rates today in the entire country? Interest rates are very, very low, but historic lows. So dividends and things like that that are paid out are also very, very low. So this is projecting that for the next 50 years or 100 years that these low historic dividends will be paid. But again, we fully expect those to increase. So odds are this illustration will look better. And anybody that's had a policy for over a year two years, three years, four years, go look at your in-force illustration and compare it to the illustration you were given at the beginning. And nine times out of 10, the in-force illustration, you're actually doing better than what the thing was actually originally illustrated out. And one of the reasons for that is, and that's one of the reasons we use the companies we use is because a lot of times they're gonna under promise and over deliver, especially on these illustrations. There's a couple other popular companies out there um, but from experience, we've seen that their illustrations up front and what their illustrations look out years later 
don't match up on the, on the negative side, actually. They're not performing as well as the original illustration. And that's one of the reasons we love Lafayette. We love One America and the way that they operate. So um, that's why we always look at these non-guaranteed assumptions and why I'm going to use this column for this example right now, okay? So what this illustration shows is that the first year, um, this 42-year-old male is going to put $150,000 into his policy and he's going to have $130,000 in cash value. Uh, the cash value column is what's available for loans, okay? So he's gonna be able to borrow back out the first year, 130,000 of that 150,000 to put to work. And then just to further explain this um, illustration, this is the total net cash value over time. This is the annual increase in net cash value. And then this is the death benefit. So real fast, you'll notice that the death benefit is higher the first seven years, and then it drops down. And then once it drops, then it continues to climb again for the rest of his life, all right? And I can continue showing this. It keeps going, you know, right through 106 years old. And it, it will go for life too, if you keep looking. So right through 121 years old and what that would look like. So it continues to increase every single year for the rest of his life in this. All right, now the reason why this drops is because to get the $150,000 in there the first year and to get this very high cash value growth early on, we have to add a little bit of term insurance so the policy does not mech. However, term insurance doesn't have any value for banking purposes. So as soon as we can drop the term, we get it off the policy because again, we're building this for, uh, for banking purposes, not for death benefit purposes. So we drop that thing off um, as soon as we can. And then from there, uh, the death benefit will start growing again for the rest of his life until he passes. And then all of that money will get paid to the beneficiary um, tax tax-free upon their graduation. All right. So what I wanted to show you guys is if this gentleman was to use this policy to originally pay off some debt, okay? So let's say that he had a few hundred thousand dollars in debt that he wanted to pay down. So these first six years, the first six years, Every year, he's going to use the money that's going in and the cash value. Let's just say the first five years. The first five years, he's going to use all of the money going in and all of the cash value to pay down debt. All right. So he's going to go to the mapping team. Our mapping team is going to create a debt map that shows him exactly how to use 130 the first year, 47 the second year, 50,000 the third year, 52 the fourth year, and 55 the fifth year. He's going to use all of this money to pay down his debt. So now he has a debt map that he's working on to pay down the debt, to snowball the recycled and recaptured interest that he's now recycling back to himself instead of giving to other people and paying down that debt instead of 26 years, paying it down to let's say eight years or whatever it is, right? Whatever that debt map comes out to be. So he's paying it off a lot quicker. However, he's now to a point where he has no more debt to pay off. So now in the sixth and seventh years, he has money going into this policy. The cash value is growing. 50,000 goes in in year six, 50,000 goes in in year seven. I have an increase in cash value of, of 57,000. So about 14%, 15% cash on cash um, and about 20% cash on cash, I guess. So we can do the math in a second on that um, each year. And he now has that cash value sitting there as he doesn't know what to do with it, right? So this is where the private money club and private money lending will come in handy because this guy right here has a successful business. He's busy working. He doesn't want to spend any time buying more real estate. He just wants to passively put his money somewhere, let it work for him and create more money while the money's in here compounding and growing. So this is the example I'm going to show you. Any questions on that real fast though, on the illustration or where this is coming from? If not, I'm going to dive right into it. Real fast, Jeffrey said, how do you determine which company of the 
of the three you use for different people, all the policy structure differently based on what the individual's goals are, pay off debt or save for you. Yeah, Jennifer, um, it can depend on what state that they're located in. It can depend on their age and their health. It can depend on how much they're putting into the policy. And yes, what their overall goals are um, will help determine which company um, you know, will work best for their situation. Uh, Lafayette Life Insurance Company has been working really great right now. So we have a lot of policies have been going through there. One America, a great company. Mass Mutual, because of some of their loans and stuff, not as much, but can make a lot of sense depending on the situation. So that's everything that goes into it. Like whenever we start a policy, um, you know, our team from a planning standpoint, from a health standpoint, and from an um, infinite banking standpoint, look at that, and we all decide, you know, which way to go with that. And then once we decide which company will work the best, then we play with the policy to build it for you to make sure that it's going to fit and work for your needs as well. So there's a lot that kind of goes into that. And then depending on if we need to make changes and things like that, we can definitely do that as well. All right. Now, I don't see any other questions, so let's jump into this. All right, I'm gonna just write some numbers on here from this illustration and I'm gonna stop the share so everybody can see the screen. All right, all right, here we go. All right, so in the sixth year, Okay, so again, the first five years of policy deposits and cash value are in a debt map being used to snowball and pay down all the debt. However, we're now at a point where in year six and seven, $50,000 each year has gone into the policy, and this is the cash value growth each one of those years. So let's start with that first off. So here's how you do the math on this. So, so in year six, $50,000 goes into the policy and it grows by 57,406. So if we take 57,406 and we subtract 50,000, because that's what it took to get the money there, we have 7,406. So we had $7,406 in profit, let's say that year, um, because when we put $50,000 in, we now have 57,406 available to pull back out to use. So in my eyes, that's $7,406 worth of profit um, for just simply having this policy and putting the money in, right? So that's about, let me just do the math. So you take 7,406, divide that by the $50,000 investment to make it. And it's a 14.8. So it's a 14.8% cash on cash return. Does that make sense to everybody? The second or the seventh year, 50,000 goes in, makes 60,000. So let me do that math real fast. So we have 60,000, 651 minus the 50, one, two, three, 50,000. We had to put in to get it. So we made 10,651. So $10,651 we made in profit um, in our private bank in the seventh year of having this policy for doing basically nothing. So if I take that money and we divide that by the 50,000 we put in to get it, it gives us a 21.3. 21.3% cash on cash return on our money, all right? Now, we have $100,000. Now we have more, we have, let's see, we have a hundred and, what is that? 107, 100 and, 117, right? You guys getting that 118,000? I'm not doing the math, but it's right around that, right? 
118. Let's see, 50. I used to be really good at math. I don't practice anymore. What is this guy, 60? 118, 060, something like that, right? Let's just say $118,000. It's an illustration, so it could be off a little bit anyways. All right, so 118,057. All right, that was pretty close. All right, so let's just say $118,000. All right, so, so we have now $118,000 available that we can pull out of this policy um, to use for whatever we wanna use it for, right? So let's say that we join the private money club. And Chris Rude has a flip that's available and he's willing to pay you as the lender 12% interest on your money interest paid monthly okay and so what we do is we're going to take $118,000 and we're going to lend this to Chris Rude okay now your money's protected in a first lien position by a contract by a mortgage or a deed of trust and a promissory note a contract that shows exactly the terms of this deal and protects you completely by giving you first lien position on the real estate that's backing this deal, okay? And go back to watch the other webinars to learn more about exactly how that works. All right, now we have $118,000. And just for simple math, let's say we lend this to Chris Root for one year, for 12 months, okay? So let's do the math on that. So we take 112, or no, no, what is it, 118? So we take 118,000, and we times that, oops, sorry, 118,000 times 0. 0.12, 12%, right? So it's 140, it's 14,160. All right, so that means over the course of a year, our $118,000 just made an, uh, $14,160, okay? Is everybody following that? All right, now, one thing I wanna mention, or let me add this up. So we had $100,000 go in and $100,000 go in, all right? So we have $100,000 in this deal. Now, we immediately made $18,000 in our policy, right? Then we made another $14,000 off interest, okay? So we now have 118. plus 14, all right, $132,000. Okay, we now have made, we now have created in the, in the one year time span from $100,000, we've now got up to $132,000. Now, there is one thing that I have not talked about yet on this deal. Well, there's two things that I haven't talked about yet on this deal. Does anybody know what they are? When we borrow 118,000 from the whole life policy, do we have to pay the insurance company anything to borrow that money? We do, right? We pay, we pay 5% simple interest on any outstanding loans throughout the year to the insurance company. So if we pulled this money out and we, and we had it out for the entire year, we're going to pay 5% interest on that. So let me see what that is. And actually the interest rates a little bit lower. If you use a cash value line of credit, it's a lot lower and the, the interest rates are lowering right now, but just for the example, let me use 5%. So 118 times 0.05. So we're going to pay $5,900 to the insurance company to use that money. So let's do minus. Hmm. 
All right. So for the ability to be able to do this, we have to pay the insurance company $5,900. So we take 132,000 minus 5,900, 126,100. Hundred and twenty-six thousand. All right. Now, the other thing that I did not mention is taxes, right? So, when this hundred and eighteen thousand dollars comes out of the policy, first off, it's coming out tax-free. Okay, loans are not taxable income. It's not ordinary or income. It's not capital gains. Nothing like that. Loans are not taxable. So the money's coming out tax-free. Now, the money that the profit that you make on this deal will be taxable. However, the money that's sitting in your policy compounding when you're getting these cash on cash returns, this is not taxable. So as the growth, you know, so this 18, so from your original 100,000, $18,000 of this $126,000 profit is not taxable because that was in the policy growing tax-free, right? So let me do that. 126 minus 18. What does that give us? 8,000? All right. And if you're doing it right, if you're doing it right, talk with your CPA. Again, I'm not an accountant, guys, but if you're doing it right, there are ways to make the interest 5,900, the interest repayment. There's ways to make this stuff tax deductible. And there's ways to run it through a business or something like that to do that. There's ways to arbitrage the money where we take the money from our personal policy, lend it to our company at a higher rate. And then we also, and then we're making the tax deduction through the company, as well as making a little bit extra interest on this deal for us personally through the arbitrage. So that's getting a little bit more high level. We'll get into that stuff over the next five weeks on the Wealth Webinar Series. So if you like this stuff that we're talking about right now, make sure you join us for the Wealth Webinar Series the rest of the, um, the, rest of the month and going through December because we're going to start getting real deep into this stuff right now and talking different tax strategies and things like that. So I'm keeping a little more basic right now, but so that would be taxable, right? To get to this 26... $26,000 profit. So really your profit is actually more when the majority of it is not taxable income, right? So just showing you guys like some examples right there of how that works. But how many of you would be happy with basically zero risk in this part of your investment, a little bit of risk in the private lending aspect of it, you know, because it's backed by a, a solid piece of real estate. It's controlled by a very experienced investor. You have your first lien position. So that's what I mean by very little risk. So very little risk in this part of the, in this part of the growth. So no, little to no risk at all and very little risk to earn. What is that? $100,000 grows by 26,000, 26%. Is that math right? 26% return on your money with little to no risk. How many of you guys like that idea right there? And then if I was to show you, watch this. And then what if I showed you this? And then, okay, you get the money back. We put it back into the policy. And then we do it again in year seven. And then we do it again in year eight. And then we do it again in year eight. I mean, look at this. How many of you, like he's 40 years old in this, right? What about when he's 60? All right. Let's just say he's shooting for a retirement age of 60, whatever that means to him. But at 60, he's like, I don't want to do anything else. I just want to travel. I don't want to think about it. Is this hard to do, first off? Private lending does not make take much time. You sign a couple documents. It's all done via the internet these days. You don't have to know the person, go there, be there, nothing. When you develop the relationship, you do these deals, these private lending deals, over and over and over and over and over and over again to the point where it's just boring. But is making 26% of your money boring? Absolutely not. I'll take that all day long for a boring, safe investment, right? So that, that's one aspect of it. You do it over and over again. But what would these numbers look like? You know, I mean, because look at this. 
when he turned 60 years old, he put $17,000 into the policy, but the cash value grows by $63,000. I'm not going to do the math on that, but that's like 400%. Okay. So if I factor in the growth of the money, along with making the returns on this thing, do you see how this money starts to really multiply, so to say? So I hope you guys are starting to like this and, and get some ideas of what you can do with these policies after the debt's paid off, after you're done buying all the things you can buy, get that money to work. Because the money, the money sitting in this policy right here, the money sitting in that policy, great, okay? It's tax-free growth. It's safe. It's protected from, in most cases, protected from lawsuits and, and judgments and bankruptcies and well, you know, all that stuff, right? The money in there grows tax free. It's building that legacy aspect for later on through the death benefit, you know, all that stuff. So the money just sitting in there doing nothing is great. But taking that money and putting it to work, that's where the fun really starts to kick in. And that's what infinite banking concept is all about. And that's why the money multiplier does this all day, every day using these boring, specially designed and engineered guaranteed whole life policies to be able to create these kinds of returns. So now that I'm drawn all over my board and had some fun with it, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, Jennifer, sometimes that'll happen. You know, um, you know, companies change their policies too. I'll add one thing, Jennifer. Um, you know, so for instance, policies that One America had last year are different this year. Policies Lafayette had are different now. Mass Mutual is constantly updating policies. So if we see that a company has updated their policies as well, and they're not working as well any longer for uh, money multiplier, it doesn't mean your policy, your policy could have been great. It could have been the company that made a change to how their policies are designed that made us want to make a change to a different company. So we're always on this. I mean, again, we we do, you know, hundreds and hundreds of 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 cases every single month. We talk, um, you know, Brent is constantly talking with the insurance company higher ups and CEOs and things like that. So, you know, whatever we know that a change happens or something, we're right there making it happen too. We're always playing with policy designs, figuring out what's the best way to do that. Again, this is all we do all day, every day. And we have an entire team that works on this stuff. So, all right, guys, well, that's all I have for you. So, Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Everything. If you guys need anything at all, have any follow-up questions or want to talk about your specific question, uh, situations, send me an email, snaggy at chrisnoggle.com, 561-313-6213. Send me a text message if you need anything. I hope every single one of you has an awesome Thanksgiving holiday. And I myself am very, 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 very thankful for you and for being here and for being part of BYOB, the Money Multiplier, Money School, and everything we do. So I really, truly hope you and your families have an awesome holiday season, and we will catch you guys either Wednesday on the Wealth Webinar Series and our Sorry, other webinars, or we'll see, you, uh, we'll see you next week. And that's Series talking to me, so I'm out of here. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much.